Bismillah alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min sharubi anfusina wa sayyati a'malina man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah. Wa man yudlil falahadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So... Last time, we've gone into uh, visiting the sick and the manners of the visitation of the sick. And we'll continue with that, inshallah, maybe with some overlap. Oh, inshallah. So, just as a reminder also, in case we did not cover any of these things, or we forgot about them. We, we said that visiting the sick is a highly rewardable act that Allah Azza wa Jal emphasized because He, the sick, needs our attention, needs our support. And we also, in fact, get something from that visitation. And we also talked about, you know, the manners in terms of how long you should stay and how you should look and you're trying to comfort him, um, etc., etc. Then we moved on when we talked about uh, the dead or if somebody, you know, is afflicted and if you witness someone's funeral. And uh, we said that one of the rights of or some of the rights of the Muslims upon a Muslim as he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, haqqul muslim ala al-muslim, khams, there are five that the Prophet had listed. And he said, raddu salam replying with salam when they give that to you, iyadatul marid, visiting the sick. And then we said, following the funeral, tashmeetul atis, saying, yarhamukallah, to the one who says, alhamdulillah, after they sneeze, wa ijabatul da'wa, and accepting their invitation. So he said, these are the haqooq. So following the funerals is also similar to an act of visiting the sick. Because both of them are of benefits to the one who has been afflicted and the one who is doing that visitation. So the one who is sick benefits and that's dead benefit when we go and pray for them and we also follow them in, uh, in the funeral. And the one who visits also benefits. Benefits in the reward that Allah will give to him and how much hasanat Allah will give to him. And on top of that also, and it's important, and this is why Allah gave rewards for that, is because of the reminder that it gives. The reminder that it gives, in addition to the benefit that you uh, give to that person. So in point number 28, he says, He says, When are you going to console the living because of the passing of a loved one? Okay? He says, it's important also to make dua for the deceased. So as you are consoling them, make dua for the deceased. And he quotes here the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Abu, when he, Abu Salama passed away. So when he was consoling his family, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma ghfir li Abi Salama. Ya Allah, forgive Abu Salama. Warfa' darajatahu fil mahdiyin. Elevate his rank among the guided. And take care of his progeny. Okay? Take care of his progeny, those he had left behind after him. Ya Allah, forgive him. Or forgive us and forgive him, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Uh, expand his grave for him. And that is a sign. When Allah Azza wa expand the graves of someone, that means that person is blessed. It's not a tight place. But it's a, an expanded place. It's a comfortable place. And that's part of the blessings that Allah gives to a person when they are, when he's pleased with them. Give him light inside of it. Huh? So the grave typically is a lightless, small area. But through Allah's rahmah, it is transformed. It's connected to Jannah. So he gets, if a person is uh, blessed, he will get some of the blessings of Jannah in his grave and included in these blessings is that the darkness of the grave turns into light. And then the tightness of the grave is eliminated and becomes an expanded, comfortable place. So he made dua for the deceased. So when you console someone, it's beautiful that they hear that from you. 
Uh, if you remember such a dua or you get the gist of it, what did the Prophet say? You get the gist of it so that the next time you make dua to such a person, so it comforts their heart and they know that, well, I may have lost someone, indeed I've lost someone, but if I make dua for them that Allah gives them this and this and this, they could actually be blessed at this moment. So this motivates them to do what? Rather than sit and weep and feel miserable, to say something good and to do something good so that that could reach the dead person. Huh? That could reach the dead person. And he says, وَيَحْسُنُ أَنْ يَكُونَ حَدِيثِي كَمَعَ الْمُعَزَّةِ فِيمَا يَتَّصِلُ بِتَخْفِيفِ وَقْعِ الْمُصِيبَةِ He says, it's recommended or it's best that when you are consoling someone, those who are being consoled, what do you say to them? Or if you sit, what do you talk about? He says, something that will alleviate the pain that they have, alleviate the hardship of theirs, comfort them. Uh, comfort them. بِذِكْرِ أَجْرِهَا وَأَجْرِ الصَّبْرِ عَلَيْهَا Meaning, remember, reminding them of the reward of being patient for this affliction, for this disaster. And that Allah Azza wa Jalla is beside them and Allah will help them to direct them. Uh, to direct them to how to cope and how to deal with all of this. How to view it again as something that is from Allah and Allah can assist through it. Because that person, all of us, when we get tested like that, we may lose our patience, we may lose any wisdom that we may have, and we only see the pain. You don't see anything else, you see, just see the pain. But when someone comes and reminds you that, no, this, behind this pain there is something else, that behind this pain there is wisdom, behind it there is rahmah, behind it there is a blessing that is waiting for you, and you can deal with it differently, and you can feel better about it, and you can redirect your energy so that rather than, as we said, sitting miserably, missing the other person, you start turning it into an action plan. What am I going to do? Because you have someone who has just died and you miss him. So what are you going to do to bridge that emotional gap? It says, okay, if you can do something for them, that will help them in their grave. If you make dua for them, if you give sadaqah on their behalf, if they owe somebody something and you go and repay it, if, they, uh, somebody, if they've insulted someone, you can go and ask them to forgive them. So all of these things on behalf of the dead will help them. And you know that you had made their life better in the grave and in the hereafter. So that is a much positive response, of course. And he says, in, in general, he says, it is better also good to remind them of some ayat and some ahadith that would enliven their spirit and remind them that they should be patient and why they should be patient. And he says here, you know, um, uh, the ayah when Allah says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Give glad tidings to those who are patient. Those who are, when they are afflicted, they will say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We belong to Allah and we shall return to Him. So when you tell a person or remind them, say this. And we should actually remind ourselves that whenever you are faced with any affliction, big or small, huh? أصابتهم مصيبة what, what, what is this مصيبة? Anything that discomforts you Anything that annoys you Anything that uh, uh, يعني, uh, is hard on you Is a مصيبة And it could be something small or It could be something big So to remind this person Oh say إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ okay? And there's something else that can be said We'll come to it But And to understand what that means So if you can say إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ But not understand what it means so it may not actually change anything. But when you understand, what does it mean, inna lillah? What does it mean? We belong to Allah. Inna lillah. Yani we belong to Allah. So I don't own anything, including my own self, my own body. I don't own it. So recognize also that other, that other person, although he was your son, your daughter, your father, your mother, your spouse, and you want them to be next to you all the time, you don't own them. Somebody else uh, controls what they do. He wants them here. He wants them there. And now he has taken them back. وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ So Allah gave them to you. Right? You did not give them to yourself. No single thing in your life, you gave that to yourself. Allah gave it to you. And now Allah retrieves it. So when you understand that Allah gave and Allah retrieves, and you understand that that person did not disappear. Yani our belief in a day of judgment, or in an afterlife rather, uh, alleviates the pain that we have because you know that there is another opportunity, another plane of existence where all, soul is, all souls are going to meet each other. All. 
So it's just a momentarily, let's call it, or temporary separation, and then you get to see them again. So if you know this, and you know that you can improve their life and elevate their station in Jannah or protect them, uh, save them from hellfire, or help save them from hellfire by the good things that uh, you do, then of course that will change your uh, perception and change your, uh, your emotions about the uh, issue. Uh, he says, etc., etc." Et so whatever, whatever you remember of a hadith, and this is the one that I wanted uh, to say that uh, remember the saying of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam: "Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khalif li khayran minha." He says, "Ya Allah, reward me for my affliction, for my musiba, for my pain, and compensate me or replace it with something better." So this is something to remember. In Arabic, if you can, if not, in English or any other language that you speak. It does not matter as long as you remember those two phrases. Allahumma ajirni fi musibati. What does that mean? Ya Allah, reward me for my musibah. Just remember it. Because we don't often remember that. Okay? Something bad happens and we're just experiencing pain. That's it. And we're dealing with pain and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to save myself from this. Let me talk to this person, that person. And you sit and you lose hope. This is what we go through. But if you remember, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And then you say, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati. Ya Allah, reward me in my affliction for it. And replace it with something better. Compensate me and replace it with something better. That is what Allah Azza wa is going to do. So Allah rewards you for it. And will give you something better than the thing that has been taken away from you. Either in the dunya or the akhirah or both. But you just wait for something better. And of course, when you say this, Again, it refocuses your attention. So you know that there's something bad happened, right? Something bad is happening at this moment. Whenever something bad happens, it traps you. Can't think about anything else except that thing, right? Can't think. Like, how do I escape it? How do I overcome it? Why is this happening to me? So it sh- it's as if it shrinks you and it starts controlling you. You say, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati. Now... You yeah, are beginning to grow bigger than your problem. Yeah, Allah reward me for this musibah. Ah, so it's not this musibah happening for no reason. There is good deeds that follow. Okay, so now it shrinks, becomes small. And replace it with something better. Uh, it even shrinks more and it becomes even smaller. Because I know that it's going to what? End. It's going to end. Okay? So if you believe that it's going to end it becomes easier to tolerate it. And that something better will follow it, it becomes even easier and easier to tolerate that. So one of the best things that you can tell a person who is afflicted, no matter what their affliction is, is to teach them that, is to remind them of it. And we know it, but we forget it. So remind them of these things. And he says also, وَمِثْلَ قَوْلِهِ And like the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, when his son Ibrahim passed away when he was an infant. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in this famous hadith, إِنَّ الْعَيْنَ تَدْمَعْ Indeed, there are the eye tears, and the وَالْقَلْبُ يَحْزَنْ And then the heart is saddened. وَلَا نَقُولُ إِلَّا مَا يُرْضِ الرَّبُّ We will only say, will not say except what pleases Allah. وَإِنَّ بِفِرَاقِكَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ لَمَحْزُنُونَ uh, Oh, Ibrahim, we are sad, okay, to be det- uh, uh, separated from you. Because of your separation or being separated from you, we are sad, Ya Ibrahim. So here the Prophet ﷺ is experiencing human emotions. But is teaching you and me how to deal with them. So the Prophet ﷺ is not an angel, meaning that he does not experience sorrow. No, he had a son. And when you lose a son, what? it is sad. It is naturally sad. So it's not that the Prophet did not feel any sadness. So he said in this hadith that the heart experiences sadness. And then there were tears in his eyes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of the sahaba did not understand. Does this experience discontent, unhappiness with Allah's decree? He says, no, this is rahmah. This is natural rahmah that you find, an attachment that you have with other beings. So it's natural that when they leave, when you see them dying, and when they leave, that you will experience, experience this sadness. Experience what? This rahmah. 
tears coming down from the eyes, that does not negate, does not contradict being content with Allah's decree because they are separate. So I can be content with Allah's decree. How? By knowing, by first not saying anything that displeases Allah. That's why He says, "Wala naqulu illa ma Rabb." We will not say anything except what pleases Allah. Meaning, thanking Allah and supplicating and asking Him for support. And that stems from the basis of it is the heart not feeling anything or not believing anything that displeases Allah. Meaning that Allah took away something of mine that he should not have taken. That shouldn't be the case. And if someone, some of these thoughts enter our minds, we should stop them and say, no, this actually belonged to Allah. Belonged to Allah. And if that person who died were to be given the choice whether he wanted to stay after he sees what Allah has for him, whether he should stay or leave, he would choose what Allah chooses. And if Allah were to actually show you everything, you would not make a choice different than Allah's choice. So, yes, this sadness is natural. So you don't, we don't need to pretend that it's not there. But what alleviates all of that is our knowledge that Allah is there and that His choice is better than our choice. So when you do with this, you can deal with whatever comes your way. Allahu A'lam. He says, you know, aqwalu um, salaf you know, some of the uh, sayings of the Salaf about death. And this is useful, yani, if... Um, useful, but based on the occasion, right? If somebody is deeply emotional, you don't need to go and tell them all of these things because that may sadden them even more and more. You pick your spots. But anyway, that Umar radiallahu anhu used to say, كُلَّ يَوْمٍ يُقَالُوا مَاتَ فُلَانٌ وَفُلَانٌ وَلَا بُدَّ مِنْ يَوْمٍ يُقَالُوا فِيهِ مَاتَ عُمَرٌ It says every day they say, so and so died and so and so died, and one day will come where they will say, Umar is dead. And it did. Meaning that every single day, you find that there's a list of people dying, and they say so and so died today, so and so died today. It doesn't affect you in our, in, in our life. It doesn't, so and so died. Oh yeah, a family relative died. Oh yeah, a family friend died. Yeah. But that family friend, and that, that's a person who before you, I mean, before he used to hear about other people dying, and now it came to him. The same thing to all of us. There will come a day, Allahu A'lam when, but that will be the day when they'll say so and so and die. So it means that everybody is going to die. So don't be so uh, uh, shocked by it when it happens, if you know that everybody is supposed to die. And he says, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu wa rahimah, he, uh, he said, إِنَّ رَجُلًا لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ أَبِهِ آدَمَ أَبٌ حَيٌّ لَعَرِيقٌ فِي الْمَوْتِ He says, there's a man or a person who between him and Adam, between him and his father Adam, there is no living father. Indeed, he is a veteran in death, meaning it's an expert in death, in a sense that if you look at your father and he's dead and his father is dead and his father is dead and everybody to Adam is dead, means that what's next? You. So ariq means like he's a veteran, experienced, meaning that it is coming your way. And he says also, uh, Hassan al-Basri said, Ya ibn Adam, innama anta ayyam kullama dhahaba yawmun dhahaba ba'duk. He says, O child of Adam, you are composed of days. When you take few of them, few of you are gone. So you are made of what? I don't know, 10,000 day, days or 20,000. Or so if you take one, then there's one less. Two, there's three, two less. Three, three less. So each day that goes, there's less of you, less of you, less of you, until it is all gone. And he said also, Rahimahullah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَجْعَلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَاحَ دُونَ الْجَنَّةِ He says that Allah Azza wa did not give the believers comfort until Jannah. I mean, you have occasional comfort, right? They have occasional comfort. But for the believer, because they move from an affliction to another, a test to another, they're staying away from haram, they're trying their best to do the halal, what pleases Allah. There's this struggle always with their nafs, with their hawa, their desire, and with the shaitan. So they can't be completely comfortable. And this life is not theirs. They don't feel at home here. They're like strangers. What about? So their full comfort is when they meet Allah Azza wa the hereafter. And he says in the other one, Ursul Muttaqina Yawm al The wedding of the pious is on the day of judgment, meaning their day of happiness. 
the day when they're really happy is on the day of judgment. Again, occasional happiness. That you may be a happy person and you have a lot of good things in your life. May Allah Azza wa make it so and bless it. But He means that true happiness, because of what we talked about, true happiness, maximum happiness, can only exist when you meet Allah Azza wa Jal. It does not exist in this life. And there's one here, verse of poetry, couple here. Uh, Naam, he says, uh, this, this, this one is interesting. He says, وَإِنَّا لَفِي الدُّنْيَا كَرَكْبِ سَفِينَةٍ نَظُنُّ وُقُوفًا وَالزَّمَانُ بِنَا يَجْرِي He says, we in this life are people who, like people who had boarded a ship. They're on a ship. نَظُنُّ وُقُوفًا He says, as if we think that we are still. We're now moving, but the ship is running. So it seems like as you're standing here, it's nothing, is, nothing is happening. Uh, you're just standing still. But time is moving. Whether you're still or not, whether you're active or not, time is moving. So this is just like the sea underneath the ship. Eventually you will reach your destination, even if you are just standing or sitting or sleeping. This time is like water, and we'll reach your destination, that harbor, sooner or later, depending on Allah's uh, uh, destiny. And he says here, I mean, what prompted me to mention all of, the, all of this advice, these ayat and that hadith, he says, because I have saw some individuals when they go to console someone because they lost this one or that, that one, they talk inappropriately. They talk inappropriately about this thing and that thing. This probably he's referring to gatherings. You know, people who, when they pass away sometimes, and this is a culture in some uh, places, when people pass away, they have a gathering. And they invite everybody and become sort of cultural, uh, yani a norm. You have to do it, but you really you don't have to. But they invite everybody and they serve them this and they serve them that and they pour, play Quran in the background and everybody gets invited. And of, of course, not everybody knows the deceased well, the family very well. They were just coming to give their respects. They sit and they talk and sometimes what they talk about is completely unrelated to the event. They start talking about politics and start talking about football and start talking about... So that it's done because they're just supposed to sit. They think in their thinking. They're supposed to sit to pay the respect, but they have nothing to do with what has happened and there's nothing to say. So that's why he's mentioning this, that if, if and whenever that is the case, you should only speak appropriately about... Uh, reminders and encouragement and ways that help people cope with that tragedy of theirs. And what is even better is for a person not to have such a gathering. And it's not the norm. It's not the Islamic norm. It could be cultural in some areas, but it's not the Islamic norm. But rather that when you see the family who had lost someone, you go and you console them, you go and offer your help, if there is no other way to see them except for them to designate a specific time and they, let's say in the masjid we're going to be having a reception, a brief reception just to receive everybody and so that they can pay the respects or you know, talk to the family or at home from this time to that time, you can do so. You can go and visit them, but make it brief. Why make it brief? Unless you know that they would want you to sit. If you know from them you're close enough that you know that they would like you to sit and that your presence helps, keep sitting. But if not, then you simply just, just go, say salam, say the ta'ziyah, the, condols- uh, the, the comforting words, condolences, and basically ask them if they need anything, but don't burden them. Don't burden them by staying too long. Don't burden them by asking them to offer you beverages or food. Or the, They're not in a state. It's not the sunnah for them to offer people things. It's the sunnah for people to give them something. Because they don't have the energy to be cooking to take care of themselves. So in some culture, in some of these Muslim cultures, we've switched it around. We expect them to offer us something. We go and they have to spend. They have to rent a room. And they have to offer us beverages, they have to uh, hire a reciter, and they have to sit and they have to read the Qur'an. It becomes a burden on them. Yani they just lost someone, and it's, there's a burden on them to go and rent chairs uh, and a room so that they could receive people. None of that should be done. And if this, if, I hope it's not a culture here. 
But none of that should be done. But rather, something that is easy and something that is uh, more productive than that and more a following of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He moves on in point number 29. And he says, وَمِنْ أَدَبِ الْمُجَالَسَةِ That if you are sitting with, your, with a companion, sitting with someone, from the adab of a gathering, أَنَّكَ إِذَا حَدَثْتَ ضَيْفَكَ أَوْ أَحَدًا مِنَ النَّاسِ فَلْيَكُنْ صَوْتُكَ لَطِيفًا خَفِيفًا When you're talking to someone, lower your voice and let it not be loud. Don't shout if you do not need to shout. وَلْيَكُنْ جَهْرُكَ بِالْكَلَامِ عَلَى قَدْرِ الْحَاجَةِ If you're going to speak loudly, only when needed. Only, so don't shout. And he said here that Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, part of the manners that Luqman was teaching his son, وَغْضُضْ مِنْ صوتك, Lower your voice. Like, of your voice, lower some of it. Because sometimes, according to the ayah, sometimes you need to be loud. Or somebody is way far, right? And you need, need him, right? And the only way that he can hear you, if you shout. Okay? When appropriate, you can be loud. But when it is not needed, you shouldn't. When it is not needed, you shouldn't. So part of the adab in a gathering like this or any other gathering, you're at home or visiting someone or receiving guests, is not to be loud. You're going out with your friends. This is typically more typical of the young. You're going out with your friends, you're coming to the masjid, you're going into a restaurant, out of a restaurant, in the restaurant, whatever it is, and you notice that some of us, when we're talking, we're very, very loud. He says, we shouldn't be that loud. Part of the manners of Islam is to, for you to lower your voice. Has a, have a moderate volume voice. And the Prophet, Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, in أَنْكَرَ الْأَصْوَاتِ لَصَوْتُ الْحَمِيرِ And the most hated of uh, sounds is the sound that the donkey makes. And the sound that the donkey makes is loud and obnoxious. Loud and obnoxious. So whenever you see Allah Azza wa Jal, right, likening something that we do, or the in the Quran and the Sunnah, likening something that we do to an animal, it is something discouraged. Huh? It is something discouraged. Right? Don't do something like a dog, don't do something like a chicken. Don't, whenever you see that, it is something that is discouraged. So, of course, for the donkey, in the donkey world, in the animal world, his voice has wisdom behind it. Allah gave it to it for a reason. Whether to communicate with others or to warn or this or that, there is a reason why it is there. Okay? But to us when we hear it, and this is what Allah is talking about, to you when you hear it, it's not a beautiful sound. The birds, you enjoy that, right? Um, other animals, yeah, but that is not something that you enjoy. So Allah Azza wa is telling you that when you raise your voice, you are resembling the act of a donkey when he speaks, and you don't want to be like it. So, in ankar al aswad, the thing that you hate the most, or of the things that you hate the most, is the sound of the donkey. And he says in Sahih al-Bukhari, also part of the adab, he says, Abdullah ibn Zubair, he said, he narrated, he says, after the ayah was revealed, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. He says, O you who believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضِ do not speak loudly to him like you speak loudly to each other. Okay. Because you could be loud with each other. He says, but when you're talking to him, don't be loud like you are with each other. And tahbata a'malukum wa antum la tashurun. Lest your unless if you do this, your actions will become invalid. Your good deeds will become invalid while you do not know. So that is a sin. How do good deeds become invalid? Okay, I've done something. How does it become invalid? One of the things that becomes invalid, because this is a sin that goes canceling some of the good things that you've done. Right? هَذَا al amal. Cancel some of the good things that you have done. So Allah says, this is a sin that is going to cancel some of the good things that you have done. So you should not raise your voices 
when speaking to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then he says inna alladhina yaghdduna aswatahum 'inda rasulillahi ulaika alladhina imtahana allahu qulubahum lit taqwa those whom who lower their voices next to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam those are the people whom allah azza wa jalla had filled their hearts with taqwa right? had tested their heart and had become produced taqwa out of it so taqwa produces that type of respect with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but if you are negligent of it it could be that you are committing a sin and that sin is canceling some of your good deeds. He so afterwards, he says, كان عمر بن الخطاب بعد نزول هذه الآية After it was revealed, إذا حدث النبي حدثه كأخي استرار أي كالمناجي المتحدث بسر He says, when he used to speak to the Prophet وسلم, afterwards, he'd speak to him as if he is whispering to him. As if he's telling him a secret. حتى يستفهمه لم يسمعه حتى يستفهم. And so because of that, the Prophet ﷺ would miss some of what Umar was saying and he would ask him, what did you say? So that he could repeat it so that he'd hear it again. يخفض صوته ويبالغ حتى يحتاج إلى استفهامي. Meaning he would lower his voice to the extent where the Prophet would need to ask him, repeat what you said. So this is how it changed who? The behavior of Umar رضي الله عنه and Umar why did it change his behavior? Because his heart was filled with taqwa. And he knew that Allah Azza wa Jal gets upset if his Prophet وسلم, is bothered or is insulted, like, is not respected. So part of the respect that we owe to the Prophet وسلم, when he was alive is that we're not supposed to raise our voices above his voice and not to be loud around him. And we say that, and I said that before, this is true even till today. Even till today. In two cases, and you remind me, tell me if there's a third. In one case, the more common one, is when the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is being read. Somebody is reading the hadith of the Prophet, it's as if the Prophet is speaking. With me? Am I right? Because what, if a Prophet is speaking, okay, you should listen to him. His hadith is what he said. So when he's speaking, you can't speak. You can't raise your voice above his voice. So whenever you pass by a halaqa, this masjid, another masjid, it doesn't matter. And people are talking about the Prophet and mentioning a hadith, you have an option. You either sit and listen, but if you need to talk, you leave. Because otherwise it's disrespectful. It is exactly this thing that Allah is talking about. You're raising your voice above his voice. And it's worse yet if what? You're in the same room and you're talking and you're disrupting uh, the gathering and you're tre- preventing others from listening. So you're, vo- you're competing. Your voice is competing with the voice of Muhammad wasallam. So it's highly inappropriate. And you could fall in this category of those who dis- disrespected the Prophet wasallam, And you could fall in the category of those who invalidate their deeds because it is a serious thing. Right? And it's the same thing with the Quran, obviously. Right? The other one is, of course, when you go to where? Medina. Ah, and if you go to the Medina and you enter the masjid, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. In general, in any masjid, you shouldn't be loud. Once you enter the masjid, this is the house of Allah Azza wa Jalla, you shouldn't be loud. And specifically, just because of related to this, when you go to Medina and you enter his masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you're not to be loud. Right? Because that's out of respect for the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you wouldn't be loud. And it's a good thing because you want to feel that he's there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? You want to feel that he's there and that you owe him that type of respect. Right? Yeah. And this is, uh, yani we extend this or we, can, we should extend this. Ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, this is from Al-Tabi'een. قال إن محمد بن سيرين كان إذا كان عند أمه لو رأه رجل لا يعرفه ظن أن به مرضا من خفض كلامه عندها. He says Ibn Sirin, if someone did not know him and he saw him talking to his mother, he would think that he is sick because of how faint his voice is when he's talking to his mother. And this is an adab that we don't have and for such a long time. But inshallah if we talk about it, we can revive it. But he, this is what he is. He says he understood that part of the respect that you owe to your parents is that how you speak to them and the tone. Uh, tone and the pitch. So how loud can you be? Ibn Sirin did not take a chance. So how? He says when he talks to his mother, rahimahullah, 
It says, if you don't know him, you think that he can be sick. Because his voice is so weak. He, but he's taken a precaution not to speak with full volume, lest it be considered what? Rude. Or that he could raise it. Huh? Or if his mother is angry with him, if he's at an equal uh, kind of volume, he could go higher. So he says he's just very, very, you know, respectable when he talks to his mother. And that's, again, something that we should pay attention to, that not to be loud with people whom Allah Azza wa has commanded us to respect in places that Allah had commanded us to respect as well, in those in places and the people. So with the people, we spoke about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now about parents and teachers. So elders in general, those who are older than you, and in the places that Allah loves, and also in general, not to be loud. Somebody, he, Al-Dhahabi, reports, um, this is the student of Ibn Sirin, Abdullah ibn Awn al-Basri, قال إن أمه نادته فعلى صوته صوتها فخاف فأعتق رقبتين. He said, إن أمه نادته. He says this Abdullah ibn Awn, his mother called him, okay, from afar. So she was loud. So he responded with a loud voice. فعلى صوته صوتها. His voice was louder than her voice. قال فخاف. So he was frightened because he has done that. فأعتق رقبتين. So he freed two slaves. Right? Now freeing two slaves is not two dollars. It's expensive. And that's a lot of money. Okay? Translated whatever way you, it makes sense to you. Uh, two uh, new pieces of clothes and then you just give those away. You did not wear those. And you want to wear them, but he said, I'm giving this or those away for the sake of Allah. Meaning, he gave away things that are dear to him. Because he was what? Freed. And I want Allah to forgive this sin. So here. So these are good reminders. Good reminders that, oh, I should respect other people like that, especially my parents, and I shouldn't be loud. I shouldn't be loud. Now, and he says, oh, Amr ibn Abdul Aziz, uh, he says, صوته, A person was uh, talking to him and he raised his voice, or around, around him and he raised his voice. Kuf. He says, stop what you're doing. It's enough, right, for you to, just, if, to speak so that I can understand what you're saying, not beyond that. Don't be too loud beyond need. So if, if you're sitting next to me, you should only speak as loud as needed for me to understand you. Beyond that, you shouldn't do any of it. This is in, this is in point number 30. And of course, not to raise your voice, obviously, also uh, when, when arguing with someone. But we'll come to that, inshallah. This is point number 30. That is, if your companion, your friend, someone is talking to you about something and you know it, don't embarrass him by showing him that you know it already. Or you know more than what he's talking about. Oh, you know, I know this already. I know more than what you're talking about. He says that's also not part of the adab. Um, Ata ibn Abi Rabah, this is one of the tabi'een, he said, In the shabba la yuhadithuni bi hadith. He says, The young man or a young man would talk to me about something. Okay? Report something to me. He says, So I listen to it attentively as if I've never heard it. But I've heard it before that person was born. Meaning what? Long, long, long time ago. I've heard this thing. It's not new. But you get someone who is, you know, just learned something and, you know, is happy and he wants to share it. So he comes and he's talking to him. So he doesn't shut him out and say, you know what, kid, go. You know how long I've you know, known this? He doesn't say this. He says he listens and out of respect. And this shows wisdom, by the way. And if, you're, if you are young and you have this, then you're wise. Otherwise, an old age you'll begin to do that because you realize what yes yes I was like that person before let me listen and you learn also something else that even though I know it it's a good reminder even though I know it right I may learn something new by listening to it through somebody else so yeah that's part of the adab right 
And then he, uh, he quotes somebody else as saying, he says, if you, somebody ta- tells you something that you already have heard, or let, uh, tells you about a news that you already have, uh, have knowledge of, فَلَا تُشَارِكْهُ فِيهِ uh, don't become a partner in, in this report or in talking. If some he's talking, don't cut him. Don't uh, introduce new information. حِرْصًا عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَعْلَمَ مَنْ حَضَرَكَ أَنَّكَ قَدْ عَلِمْتَهُ You know, you don't interrupt him so that those, the rest, those who are in the gathering would know that you are also a knowledgeable person. You also know what he knows. Meaning that you do this just to show off. You do this just to tell other people that hey I'm here because this is impolite somebody starts talking and he has something to say something to report and you begin to interject and you begin to interrupt and you begin to tell him and this and this and that why? because you want to tell people I'm here you want to tell people I know you want to tell people hey look at me he said this is su'u adab this is impolite let him finish and somebody he said same thing I, I hear somebody telling me something and I know about it before his parents met. Right? And I listen to him politely until he finishes. So this is, this is how you're supposed to be, to be able to listen. And something also beautiful here in the, in the end of point 30. Uh, a wise person tells his son, تَعَلَّمْ حُسْنَ الْإِسْتِمَاعِ كَمَا تَتَعَلَّمْ حُسْنَ الْكَلَامِ Listen how, or learn how to listen well as you learn how to speak well. فَإِنَّ حُسْنَ الْإِسْتِمَاعِ إِمْهَالُكَ الْمُتَكَلِّمْ حَتَّى يُفْضِي إِلَيْكَ بِحَدِيثِهِ Listening well meaning giving the speaker the time that he needs until they finish what they have to say. And looking at him. Huh? You know, facing him and looking at him and not interrupting him even if you know what he's talking about. And that is actually beautiful. And all of us, or a lot of us, are concerned about how to talk. Okay? How to speak well. The art of public speaking, or convincing others, or winning people. But we don't emphasize as much that you should, to be a good speaker, you should listen. And we could almost say that 50% of speaking well is listening well. Because when you listen well, you'll understand what that other person is saying. When you listen well, you'll understand his points, the strengths and the weaknesses. You'll know where you agree or where you disagree. The conflicts between people happen is because they don't listen. Because I only want to speak. I only want to tell you. And I only want to convince you. I don't want to sit and listen to anything that you're saying. And if I'm listening, I'm only listening because I want to refute what you want to say. I can't wait for you to stop. And sometimes I'll stop you and I'll interrupt you. No, no, no. I know what you're going to say, right? So if I'm not listening to you, you're not listening to me. And so we'll continue fighting. But if you actually learn how to listen well, this is from... Yani you with your wife, you with your children, you with your parents, all the way to having an argument with someone, religious or otherwise. If you simply are quiet and you let them speak, that in itself is respect. And that person will appreciate and will give you the opportunity to speak and will listen to what you've said. At least you can say, as I've listened, now you got to listen to me. And of course, part of the matters, of course, that he doesn't talk about is, I mean, specifically, but he says, al-iqbalu alayhi wa ilayhi, meaning facing that person and looking at him. I can't be talking to you or have you talk to me while I'm what? Doing what? Huh? That's not adab at all. Finish. Either, either finish the conversation and then text whoever you want or text whoever you want and then talk to me. Especially kids talking to their parents. Don't think that that's acceptable at all. You put your phone down, right? You have to. You have to teach them this. It's unacceptable that your kid, especially if they're young, if they're old and they're just, you have no control over them, then khalas, it's done. But if they're young and they're still learning, you put your phone down and then you talk to someone who is older than you or younger than you, whoever. But you give them their, your full attention. 
You listen to them not only with your ears, but with your eyes and your face fully. So that they can listen to you fully. This is how you communicate with people. So that's adab. Husnu listima. Listen well so you can speak well. And subha- subhanallah, when you listen to somebody, you may discover that you don't disagree. You have a lot in common. So there is no need for you to argue. Or you discover that he has some good points. I can build on those good points. Or there is a weakness, and I found the weakness now, and I'll tell him what that weakness is, and we can solve the problem. But learning to listen is an art, as it is what? Learning how to talk. Naam, you know, and an extension of this, he says, وَمِنْ أَدْبِ الْمُجَالَسَةِ He says that if somebody is talking to you, إِذَا أَشْكَلَ عَلَيْكَ شَيْءٍ If someone is talking to you and you don't understand something that he is saying, okay? قَالَ فَاصْبِرْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَنْتَهِ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ He says, be patient until he's done and then ask about whatever you need to ask about and don't interrupt. He says, don't interrupt. And when you ask, ask gently and politely. Again, not in a challenging way, not in a demeaning way, but ask intelligently, politely, and kindly. Do not interrupt him, except if the setting is a setting of discussion and debate. Like if it is designed as, we're going to sit and discuss and debate. But that is a more specialized type of setting. Usually, we don't have those. This is for ilm. Yani for those people who will be arguing about this, uh, this uh, matter in fiqh and that matter or fiqh and they're going back and forth, back and forth, right? That's a very different setting. But for all of us when we are talking to each other, that's not that type. So wait until he's done because maybe he'll explain it. In the remainder of his speech, he'll explain what he had said. When he's done, stop him and ask him the questions that you need to ask. He says, so it's bad manners, right? To interrupt someone and object to what he is saying while he is talking. And he says also number uh, point number thirty-two. And he says, "وَمِنْ أَدْبِ الْمُجَالَسَةِ إِذَا سُئِلَ جَلِيسُكَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ أَنْ لَا تُبَادِرَ أَنْتَ إِلَى الْإِجَابَةِ عَنْهُ بَلْ يَنْبَغِي إِنْ لَا تَقُولَ فِيهِ شَيْءٍ." He says that if you're sitting with a group of people and somebody asks somebody else a question, he says, "Don't rush and answer. That's not your question." Until he has the opportunity to speak and give the full answer. And don't answer until you yourself are being asked because this is the proper way to speak. And this is the honorable way to be. And this is how you preserve your dignity and the dignity of the other person. Not when somebody asks something, especially if it is religious or who knows about this and who knows about that and they find you always jumping to answer as if you, nobody else knows but you, as if you want to prove yourself, as if you want to disprove that anybody or prove that anybody else doesn't know as much as you do. So you jump at the answer. He says, don't do this. He says, He says, do not be a person who whenever there's a question, you jump at it as if you had won a, 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 a prize. He says, if you do this, if you rush, as it is it's as if you are chastising okay the person who is being asked and the person who's asking as if you are putting down the person who's being asked you don't know but i know and don't put yourself in that position because that person will start hating you because of it and that person who's asking questions will start thinking less of you because of it. And you'll find the adab of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum ajma'in, is that this is not what they used to do, even though they knew the answer. They knew the answer, but out of respect, they would let others speak, especially if they're older, especially if this is a person's home, especially if someone else was asked, it's not my question. If they say something wrong and you need to correct it, that's different, but you correct it in a gentle manner. But if they're, what they're saying is right, you don't need to speak. As if to what? Show that I'm here. Show that I know. Show that I've studied, I've read. That is not proper. So, let me see, inshallah. We do one more or we stop here. And he says, you know, uh, finally we'll do number 33 and that will be the last one. And he says, and specifically is speaking to my... Dear Muslim sister, when you want to visit family members, when you want to visit your sisters, be careful. 
and uh, cautious about the time and the length of time that you stay and what you say in it. So he's emphasizing all that, he, all that we said, but he's double emphasizing this for our sisters in particular because they're more social. Right? They're more social than men. They visit each other more. They talk more. So they're more likely that they need to emphasize these manners among themselves more than men. Though men need it, definitely. But because there's more likely that they will be engaged in conversations. And sometimes these conversations slide into what? Improper areas. Did you know about what so-and-so did? What so-and-so said? Do you know about the latest this and the latest that? And there could be gossip in it. There could be backbiting in it. There could be mockery in it. There's haram in that conversation. So don't slide into a haram conversation. Pick those that whom you want to visit, how long you want to visit, um, what do you want to talk about, and preserve your hasanat and preserve your akhlaq from the time that you leave your house till the time that you come back. And don't do something, I know that you want to go and you want to talk and you want to have fun, but don't have your fun at the expense of others. Meaning, I don't have to feel good about myself by disparaging others and making fun of them. So-and-so did this. Isn't it funny? Isn't it ridiculous? Isn't it this? So-and-so is stupid. So-and-so is this. Don't do this. We feel better about ourselves by putting others down. So it's haram. And when you meet Allah Azza wa Jal, that fun time that you had will turn out to be a very miserable time that you'd have to account for. Why did you say this about so-and-so and about so-and-so? And just think about it. Is it worth it? It's one of the easiest thing to attack somebody or to put them down or to, you know, uh, to make fun of them. But when they see that and they know it on the day of judgment and each one is desperate, one of us is desperate for one hasana, do you think that it, they're likely to forgive you? And you can ask Allah the most generous, forgive me. Allah will forgive you. But you go to another human being and you say, forgive me. And now you, you borrow money from someone. Do they easily forgive it? Huh? No. What about hasanat and a time when you desperately need it? Do you think somebody is just going to easily give it up? Yeah, go ahead. You're forgiven. And I'm facing hellfire. I'm going to take as much as I can from your hasanat to save myself. Myself, myself, nafsi, nafsi. So you make fun of so and so, he's going to get it back from you. So it's not worth it to, for you to jeopardize dunya and akhirah for the sake of few hours where you're making fun of people. So these, this adab is really serious. We're not talking about a luxury uh, teachings here. We're talking about something that is fundamental in this life and fundamental definitely when you meet Allah Azza wa Jalla. So Jazakumullah khaira. I don't know if you have any questions or not. We're nearing the end of the book, so I do will receive, I do appreciate and do receive, uh, inshallah, feedback about what we have done, but also recommendations about what you want us to do next, inshallah. Jazakumullah khaira. Ya'at fadlani.